response to pressure from Allen and Unwin, publisher of The Hobbit, Tolkien embarked in December 1937 on a sequel without much idea of how the story might or should proceed, and was, as, as, and was as surprised at some of the unexpected turns as his future readers. He was not a methodical author who could, would or could write a synopsis for himself or his publisher and then stick to it, nor one able to apply himself to producing a regular amount of text per day or per year. But then writing was not his main line of work, he was primarily an Oxford professor with many demands on his time during term and sometimes even out of term time. Much of the writing took place during vacations, but when Tolkien was fully absorbed and time allowed, from, he would write quite quickly. He wrote the first versions of the four chapters from The Old Forest to The Sign of the Prancing Pony in a few days at the end of August 1938, and by the end of Middlemas term had reached many meetings in Rivendell have revised and expanded the existing text and rewritten the whole in 300 pages in careful manuscript. He did foresee a few basic fa facts quite early, that, that Frodo would not be able to destroy the ring, that Gollum would somehow intervene, and that the hobbits would find trouble in the Shire on their return. But often Tolkien had a clear picture only a chapter or so ahead, and sometimes not even that. New ideas in development, arose as he wrote, the work took on a life of its own and expanded in length and scope beyond all expectations. Sometimes new characters would appear, seemingly of their own accord, some fully formed, others only gradually taking on their final form, and the story already written or planned would have to be adjusted or to assimilate them, though this was not always done immediately. On other occasions, Tolkien would introduce a puzzle or a problem without himself already knowing the answer. In a letter to W.H. Auden written on the 7th of June, 1955, Tolkien described writing The Lord of the Rings. I met a lot of things on the way that astonished me. Tom Bombadil I knew already, but I had never been to Bree. Strider sitting in the corner of the inn was a shock, and I had no more idea who he was than had Frodo. The minds of Moria had been a mere name, and of Lothlorien no word had reached my mortal ears till I came there. Far away, I knew there were more, uh, horse lords on the, sorry, on the confines of an ancient kingdom of men, but Fangorn Forest was an unforeseen adventure. I had never heard of the House of Aeol, nor of the stewards of Gondor. Most disquieting of all, Saruman had not been revealed to me, and I was as mystified as Frodo at Gandalf's failure to appear on September the 22nd. <laughs> I knew nothing of the Palantiri, though the moment that the orphan stone was cast from the window, I recognized it and knew the meaning of the rhyme law that had been running in my mind. Seven stars and seven stones and one white tree. Humphrey Carpenter included a section on the writing of the Lord of the Rings in his Tolkien biography, focusing mainly on the early part, but Christopher Tolkien's minutely detailed account in The Return of the Shadow, The Treason of Isengard, The Wall of the Ring, and relevant sections of Saruman Defeated and the Peoples of Middle Earth provide readers, scholars, and critics with a wealth of information about Tolkien's processes of creation. Using these volumes, I will be discussing a few of the changes Tolkien made during the writing of The Lord of the Rings, not just for the changes themselves, but to consider how they affected the later narrative and also enrich the whole story. In the first phase of writing, begun in December 1937, there were four accounts of the long-expected party before Bingo Bolger Baggins set out on the journey east with two young cousins as his companions. Tolkien later dropped the Bolger and then fortunately replaced Bingo with Frodo. The Lord of the Rings was published in the 1950s just as Bingo, a form of social gambling, was becoming popular. <laughs> Tolkien had hesitated as to whether the party was given by Bilbo, first and second versions, or many years after Bilbo had quietly departed from the Shire by his son Bingo, third version, or his adopted nephew Bingo Bolger Baggins, fourth version. In each case, the giver of the party made a speech and using the ring vanished before quietly leaving Bag End. The chapter with Bingo's departure from Bag End in the company of two hobbits followed immediately on the party. Tolkien wrote to Alan and Unwin on the 17th of February 1938 
that he had done nothing beyond the first chapter and had only the vaguest notions of how to proceed. But on the 4th of March, he wrote, the sequel has now progressed as far as the end of the third chapter, but stories tend to get out of hand, and this has taken an unpremeditated turn. In a draft apparently written between these two letters, the story did indeed take an unpremeditated turn. In the first version of Three as Company, as Bingo and his companions walked east through the Shire, they heard the sound of hoofs and hid. Round a turn came a white horse, and on it sat a bundle, or, or that is what looked like a small man wrapped entirely in a great cloak and hood, so that only his eyes peered out and his boots in the stirrups below. The horse stopped when it came level with Bingo. The figure uncovered its nose and <coughs> sniffed, and then sat silently as if listening. Suddenly a laugh came from inside the hood. Bingo, my boy, said Gandalf, throwing aside his wrappings. You and your lads are somewhere about here. Come along now and show up. I want a word with you. Tolkien amended the draft, and in the following typescript, Gandalf has been replaced by a black rider who seems to be sniffing to get the hobbit scent. Notes suggest that Tolkien was considering <coughs> Notes suggest that Tolkien had been considering a series of separate adventures for Bingo and his companions on the lines of those Bilbo had experienced in The Hobbit. But from this point, except when, the ref when in refuges, such as Rivendell or Lothlorien, the Hobbits will be in cons constant fear of black riders. The story has become darker, more adult, closer to a thriller such as Don Buffon's The 39 Steps. It will be some time before the Hobbits learned exactly who the black riders were and why they were pursuing them. Although Bilbo and the dwarves encountered many dangers in The Hobbit, the only time they were pursued was briefly after they escaped from the Goblin Caves. In The Hobbit, Gandalf accompanied Bilbo and the dwarves from Bag End as far as the western edge of Mirkwood, and his departure there was to encourage others, especially Bilbo, to take a more positive role. Tolkien wrote to Christopher Breverton on the 16th of July, 1964, that in The Hobbit, the necromancer's function was hardly more than to provide a reason for Gandalf going away and leaving Bilbo and the dwarves to fend for themselves, which was necessary for the tale. Indeed, it was only in the absence of Gandalf that Bilbo became, as, Togo, as Tolkien, in the voice of the narrator, commented in chapter 12, the real leader of their adventure. He had begun to have ideas and plans of his own. It seems that an early idea for the sequel was that Gandalf should join the Hobbits unexpectedly near the start of the journey and probably accompany them for at least part of the way. But he had hardly appeared before Tolkien decided to leave the Hobbits to manage alone from the beginning. In the next section of my paper, I am concerned with the, mi with the mystery of Gandalf's failure to appear on the 22nd of September, mentioned in Tolkien's letter to Auden, and again in the introductory note to Tree and Leaf in which he commented that during 1938-9, the Lord of the Rings was beginning to unroll itself and to unfold prospects of labor and explanations, expansions of an exploration in yet unknown country, as daunting to me as to the Hobbits. At about that time, we had reached Bree, and I had no more notion than they had of what had become of Gandalf or who Strider was, and I had begun to despair of surviving to find out. In other words, I will be concentrating on the evolution of Tolkien's successive ideas of Gandalf's actions during the time period covered by Book One, and what, if anything, was to be revealed contemporaneously in the primary narrative to the other characters and to the reader. In the first phase of writing, Gandalf provided fireworks at the party, and as noted above, appeared only briefly before being transformed into a black rider. <laughs> On the evening of the same day, Bingo told the elf Galdor that Gandalf had told him nothing about the riders, but had advised him not to delay his departure later than autumn, and that Gandalf had come to help with the party, and then went off with the dwarves and ridden the elves as soon as the fireworks were over. Gandalf and his companions were later seen by Marmaduke and Brandybuck in Buckland, and by Trotter, early album, near Bree. Gandalf, however, knew, knew that Bingo, Bingo would be following behind 
and left a letter for him at the top of the pony. Have an innocent news on the way. The suit is getting close. Try and catch me up. And he promised to wait at Weathertop for a while. At Weathertop, he left another message that he had waited three days and then left to seek help in Riverdale. There is no mystery concerning Gansel's whereabouts. He was not expected to join Bingo and was known to be well ahead. When Bingo reached Rivendell, Gandalf commented that he was delighted to have you all here safe. I am really rather to play. I knew there were some risks, but if I had known more before I left the Shire, I should have arranged matters differently. It is clear that the story was evolving and earlier writing would have to be revised and a reason provided for the pursuit. In the second phase of composition, in early autumn 1938, there is a gap of many years between the long-expected party given by Bilbo and Gandalf's revelation of the history of the ring to Bingo. Gandalf left back end while Bingo made plans to leave, but Pop told him, don't go till you see me. I may have some news and useful information about the road, and I may want to come with you. When he failed to turn up, Bingo and his friends set out without him. This phase only extends as far as the first nights with Bombadil, but it introduces a new idea. Odo Bolger stayed behind in Crick Hollow to give a message to Gandalf if and when he turned up. But while hobbits, while hobbits slept in the house of Tom Bombadil, the house of Crick Hollow stood silent and lonely. The gate in the hedge opened and up the path quietly, but in haste, a grey man came wrapped in a grey cloak. He knocked softly on the door and waited, and then passed from window to window and finally disappeared round the corner of the house end. After a long time, the sound of hoofs was heard in the lane approaching swiftly. Outside the gate they stopped, and then swiftly up the path, there came three more figures, hooded, swathed in black, and stooping low towards the ground. One went to the door, one to the corners of the house end on either side, and there they stood silent as the shadows of black yew trees while the time went slowly by. Suddenly there was a movement. It was dark and hardly a star was shining, but the blade that was drawn gleamed suddenly as if it brought with it a chill light, keen and menacing. There was a blow, soft but heavy, and the door shuddered. Open to the servants of the Lord, said a voice, thin, cold and clear. At a second blow, the door yielded and fell back, it did not broken. At that moment, there rang out behind the house a horn. Round the corner of the house came the grey man. His cloak and hat were cast aside, his beard streamed wide. In one hand was a horn, in the other a wand. A splendour of light flashed out before him. There was a wail and cry as a fell hunting beast that has smitten suddenly and turn and fly in wrath and anguish. Distant sounds of waking and alarm rose up. Along the roads, folk were riding and running northward. Before, but before them all, there galloped a white horse. On it sat an old man with long silver hair and flowing beard. His horn sounded over hill and dale. In his hand, his wand flared and flickered like a sheaf of lightning. Behind clung a small figure with a flying cloak, Odo. Gandalf was riding to the north gate with the speed of thunder. Here, the second phase petered out. This idea is developed further in the third phase, in which Frodo Baggins replaces Bingo. As Gandalf explains to Frodo in Rivendell, I was held captive. I was caught in Fangorn and spent many weary days as a prisoner of giant Treebeard. It was a desperately anxious time, for I was hurrying back to the Shire to help you. I had just learned that the horsemen had been sent out. He arrived at Crick Hollow in time to save Odo from the Black Riders and rode with him towards Bree. A little east from Bree, he met Trotter, to whom he gave a letter for Frodo, telling him to trust, Tom, trust Trotter, who would lead him to a place where Gandalf would wait. Gandalf and Odo stayed a night at the Prancing Pony, and Gandalf told Butterbur that if anybody asked for Baggins, he should say that Baggins had ridden east with Gandalf a ruse using Odo to distract the Black Riders. At Weathertop, the company led by Trotter found a message from Gandalf. Wednesday, October the 5th, bad news. We arrived late Monday. Odo vanished last night. I must go at once to Rivendell. Make for Ford with all speed. Later, Glorfindor confirmed Gandalf had arrived in Rivendell with Hobbit. 
Sadly, Tolkien never wrote, wrote an account of what happened to Odo, nor of Gandalf's escape from giant tree. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is said of Gandalf's adventures or imprisonment in the first version of the Council of Elrond, nor in the first account of the journey south as far as Barvin's tomb, written towards the end of 1939. And while Odo was included in the first list of those to accompany further south, he was not among those who actually set out. At that point, the progress of the story came to a halt, probably for a year. But at the same time as he was writing the first version of the beginning of book two, Tolkien was, as Christopher Tolkien noted, <coughs> the beginning of the treason of Isengard, also engaged in substantial further revision, arising primarily from a changed story of Gandalf's movements and an explanation of his delay. He tried the idea that the plan to leave was entirely Frodo as a result of Gandalf's long absence. But in notes headed New Plot, Autumn 1939, Gandalf knew of Frodo's planned departure on the 22nd of September and intended to return, but was pursued by black riders. He visits Bree on way back to Shire in, on September, illegible date, but is pursued and tries to get round to west of Shire. Black riders pursue him. Gandalf has insufficient magic to cope with black riders, unaided, whose king is a wizard. They pursue him over Sand Ford, and he cannot or dare not go back to Shire. Eventually, he is besieged in the western tower. He cannot get away while they guard it with five riders. But when black riders have located Frodo and found that he has gone off without Gandalf, they ride away. Three are ahead, three follow Frodo, but miss him and get ahead of Bree. Three come behind, Gandalf follows after. Tolkien worked out various chronologies to align the movements of Gandalf and the black riders with the established account of Frodo's journey to Rivendell. Apparently, in late 1939, Tolkien began on the fourth phase, taking up these new ideas, but writing anew only when emendation and cannibalization of earlier manuscripts was not possible. In this phase, Gandalf, fearing he might not be able to get to Bag End, had left a letter to Frodo with better Butterbur, dated variously 30th of August or 12th of September, to be given to him should he pass through Green. I am starting back tomorrow and should reach you in a day or two, but things have become very dangerous and I may not get through in time. He has found the Shire, the borders are watched, and so am I. If I fail to come, I hope that will be sufficient warning to you, and you will have the sense to leave Shire at once. <coughs> Tolkien decided that Frodo should dream of Gandalf's escape. He saw the Black Riders watching a tower surrounded by a wall, and when they left, some of the by their reader, he saw a white horse leaping the wall towards him. On it rode a grey mantle figure, his white hair was streaming, and his cloak flew like wings behind him. After some hesitation, Tolkien placed Frodo's dream during the night of Crick Hollow, before they went into the old forest. He wrote a new version of the rider's attack on Crick Hollow, now taking place during the night the hobbits slept at Bree. In this, Gandalf arrived at Crick Hollow and was admitted by Hamilcar, Hamilcar Bolger, or Ham, who had remained behind, replacing Odo, and to be succeeded in turn by Fredegar, or Fatty, in the published text. Gandalf and Ham escaped on a white horse, as in the earlier version, just as the Black Riders broke open the door. This was rejected in favour of version, a version in which Gandalf arrived just as the riders sped away with Ham as a captive, with Gandalf following in pursuit. Both the riders and Gandalf thought Ham was Frodo. At Rivendell, in a text written after the fourth phase, on the, on the 5th of August 1940 or later, Gandalf tells Frodo that he rescued Fran Ham ten miles beyond the Brandywine Bridge. Ham comments that Gandalf bowled the rider that, he was, that was carrying me clean over, but did not know whether he was relieved or disgusted when he found it was Ham he had rescued and not Frodo. When Gandalf heard from Ham that Frodo had gone into the old forest, they visited Tom Bombadil before continuing the west, staying a night at the Pratsing Pony after the hobbits and Trotter had left. Gandalf reported, we found two riders already watching Weathertop. Others soon gathered round, returning from the pursuit further east along the road. Ham and I passed a very bad night besieged on the top of Weathertop. 
In the morning, we slipped away northwards, but not too secretly. I wanted to draw them off, but the chief rider was too cunning. Only four came after us, and only two pursued us far. Still, that is why they did not immediately hunt for you in the wilderness or observe your arrival at Weathershop, and why they were not in full force for the attack on you. In the fourth phase, the hobbits and trotter discover on Weathertop, as in the published text, some scratches on a stone, which Trotter interpreted, interpreted as indicating Galtham's presence there on certain dates. The two stories fit quite well, but Tolkien was not yet finished. On a sheet headed New Plot, August the 26th to 27th, 1940, a new and very significant character makes an appearance. The wizard Saruman the Grey, or Grey Saruman, sends out a message that there is important news. Trotter hears that black riders are out and moving towards the Shire. He sends word to Gandalf, who leaves Hobbiton at the end of June. Gandalf knows that nine black riders are too much for him alone. He wants to help a ceremony, so he goes to him where he lives on the borders of Rohan at Anglebel or Iongar. Saruman betrays him, having fallen and gone over to Sauron. Either he tells Gandalf false news of the Black Riders, and they pursue him to the top of the mountain, there he is left standing alone with a guard of wolves, orcs, etc., all about, while they ride off, while with mocking laugh, or else he is handed over to a giant fangborn, in brackets, Treebeard, who imprisons him. The plot then follows the riders north to the Shire and then east, kidnapping Hammond away. Gandalf escapes, no account given, and reaches Bag End and then Bree, after Frodo has left, continues east and rescues Ham. They ride to Weathertop and then north, drawing some of the riders away from the road. Tolkien saw various weak, po po sorry, weak points, especially Gandalf's failure to send an urgent message to Frodo. He also abandoned the capture of Ham, commenting black riders would obviously kill him, mm -hmm. and removed most traces of the story, his story, and of this story, and of Gandalf's various rescues. All that survives in the text is that when Fatty saw the dark shapes creeping from the front garden, he ran out of the back door in terror and raised the alarm. The black figures, finding the house empty, fled, one of them dropping a cloak belonging to Frodo on the step. Tolkien also thought that it would spoil the surprise to show Gandalf's actions in parallel with those of Frodo and company, and postpone explanations to the Council of Elrond. Only at the Council does Frodo and the reader learn that when Gandalf arrived a little later and found the cloak, he thought Frodo had been taken prisoner, and his fears were only relieved by the news he received at Bree from Butterworth that Frodo had spent the previous night there and had left that morning with Strider. In the published text, Gandalf advises Frodo to leave the Shire with some companions and make for Rivendell, commenting, that journey should not prove too perilous, though the road is less easy than it was. At the end of June, Gandalf hears some news which he felt needed looking into and tells Frodo, if I think it necessary after all for you get off, to get off at once, I shall come back immediately or at least send word, word, and as he leaves, at the very latest, I shall come back for the farewell party. I think that after all, you may leave my company on the road. Gandalf in person does not enter the established narrative again until Frodo recovers consciousness in Rivendell, and not until the Council of Elrond does Frodo or the reader hear a full explanation of what had detained Gandalf and his subsequent actions. On 27th of September, the day of the farewell party, Frodo, ling ling Frodo lingers to the last possible moment before leaving. He is already worried about Gandalf when the Black Rider adds to his fears. Tolkien continued to build up suspense. At Woody End, Gildor comments that Gandalf should be late does not bode well. In Bree, the letter from Gandalf to Frodo, written on Midio's day and which Butterfer had failed to send, urged Frodo to leave by the end of July at the latest. When Frodo asked Frider if he thinks black riders have anything to do with Gandalf's absence, he replies, I do not know of anything else that would have hindered him except the enemy himself. While revising the Council of Elrond, Tolkien's first idea for Gandalf's escape was that Elrond, having heard he was missing, sent eagles to look for him. 
It was not until the fifth version of the capsule Gandalf told his story. When he left Hobbiton to seek news, he had no definite knowledge of the riders and was, and was lured to Isengard by a messenger from Saruman, by a message, sorry, a message from Saruman conveyed by the unsuspecting Radagast. When he refused to submit to Saruman, he was imprisoned on the pinnacle, pinnacle of Orthanc in Isengard and was rescued by the eagle sent by Radagast with news gathered at Gandalf's request. In the published text, Tolkien allowed Frodo to dream of Gandalf's escape during the first night with Bombadil, but Frodo recognized its meaning only when he heard Gandalf's story in Rivendell. Christopher Tolkien's account of the development of the story in part confirms Tolkien's memory of being as mystified as Frodo at Gandalf's failure to appear on the 22nd of September. He did not reach the final solution for some time, and as the story proceeded, proceeded tried out various explanations and continually and, and eventually deliberately removed any contem contemporaneous accounts of Gandalf's actions to enhance tension in the primary thread. And his final solution immediately expanded the scope of the story and the landscape in which it is set, opening a second front with the treachery of Saruman, the dominant in Book 3, beginning with the kidnapping of Merry and Pippin by hawks from Isengard, followed by the chase of the three hunters, the march of Treebeard and the Ents, and, and, and their attack on Isengard, Gandalf's overthrow of Saruman's agent in Ezeras, and his healing of Theoden, the Battle of Helm's Deep, and the dramatic parley on the steps of Orthanc with the defeated Saruman. Moving on from, from uh, Gandalf to another point, the final composition of the Company of the Ring to go with Rhoda was not achieved immediately. All members played a significant part in the story, but two contributed in a rather unexpected way. In a note written preceding the first version of the Council of Elrond, Tolkien stated that the company should consist of five more hobbits, including Trotter, Gander, an elf Glorfindel, and a dwarf, Thra, changed to Burin, son of Balin. The seed of the later inclusion of Gimli and Leverus was present here. In the earliest version of the Council, written in autumn 1939, those present included two dwarves, Gimli from the Hobbits and Burin, later to be replaced by glowing son Gimli. And I think Gimli, or not Glowing, Glowing for the first one, I'm not sure. No. Um, glowing from the Hobbit and Burin, later replaced by Glowing son Gimli, and an old elf Galdor, a message from the King of the Wood Elves in Mirkwood. Although Glorfindel, an elf of Rivendell, was among those chosen for the company, in the earliest version of the council, in the in, when the earth of in the first version of the Ring Go South, which only reached as far as Barin's tomb, the company consisted of five hobbits, plus Baramir, Boromir, and Gandalf. In the following version of the council, Elrond said the company should represent the free folk of the world, and chose Galdor for the elves and Gimli for the dwarves. In the third version of the council, when Galdor reported Gollum's escape made possible because the elves had treated him with too much kindness, Glowin reacts with risk, with the comment that the elves were less tender with him when he was their prisoner. Not until the second version of the Ring goes south was Galdor replaced by Leverus. On several occasions in the published work, on the journey south and through Moria, and as they approach Lothlorien, Leverus and Gimli display awareness of the ancient antagonism between their peoples, each declaring that it was not the fault of his people that friendship between the races was waning. <coughs> the company are received graciously at Carus Galathon by Celeborn and Galadriel, but the former, on hearing that the dwarves had again stirred up evil in Moria, regrets allowing the company into Lorien. Galadriel intervenes, praising the beauty of the former dwarf kingdom. She looked upon Gimli, who sat glowering and sad, and she smiled, and the dwarf, hearing the names given in his own ancient tongue, looked up and met her eyes, and it seemed to him that he looked suddenly into the heart of an enemy and saw their love and understanding. Wonder came into his face, and then he smiled and answered. He rose clumsily and bowed, bowed in dwarf fashion, saying, Yet more fair is the living land of Lorien 
and the Lady Galadriels above all the jewels that lie beneath the earth. From that moment, Gimli became her champion, challenging Aoba when he spoke disparagingly of her, treasuring her gift of three golden hairs, hoping that he ever returns home to treat it as an heirloom, a pledge of goodwill between the mountain and the wood until the end of days. And from that time, he and Legolas are firm friends, despite the history of hostility between their races. This is perhaps the prime example of one of the themes running through the work, abandoning preconceived opinions and learning to appreciate other points of view. Their, their inclusion also provides Tolkien's readers with their closest contact with the representative of each race. Yes, there were 13 dwarves in The Hobbit, but mainly seen en masse and sometimes treated as figures of fun. Gimli is a brave fighter and a loyal companion. In his description of the beauty of the caves of Helm's Deep, he waxes lyrical and contradicts a common picture of dwarves as mainly seekers of treasure. No dwarf could be unmoved by such loveliness. None of Durin's race would mine those caves for stones or ore. Not if diamonds and gold could be got there. Because of their friendship, Legolas agrees to visit the caves at Hell's Deep with Gimli, and the latter agrees to explore Fangorn Forest with Legolas. When eventually Legolas leaves Middle Earth, Gimli goes west with him. Elves are in the forefront of action in Silmarillion, but there they are larger than life and painted in broad strokes. We learn quite a lot about elves from Legolas. He can run on snow, he can see great distances, he is a superb bowman, he needs sleep or rest, he rides without saddle or reins. Of particular interest is his explanation of how the elves immortal within Arda experience time. For the elves, the world moves and it moves both very swift and very slow. Swift because they themselves change little and all that fleets by is a grief to them. Slow because they need not count the running years, not for themselves. The passing seasons are but ripples ever repeated in the long, long stream. But what about the Ladrian and Lothlorien? Earlier I quoted Tolkien writing in 1955 that of Lothlorien no word reached my mortal ears till I came there. In the second version of The Ring Goes South, Gandalf did say they must go down the Morthon into the woods of Lothlorien possibly just a name Tolkien invented, because he felt one was needed, though its cinder in form suggests at least some connection with elves, but otherwise nothing to indicate that either Tolkien or the company had any idea of what lay before them on the other side of the mountains, beyond going down the river, variously called Redway Black Road to Morthond or Silver Road to reach the Great River. Even the sketch of the plot written just before Tolkien embarked on the first Lothlorien chapter, gives no hint of the Golden Ward of Celebon or Galadriel. Just reach Lothlorien December 15. Take refuge up trees. Elves befriend them. December 15, 1617, they journey to Angle between Anduin and Blackwood. There they remain long. While they are up trees, orcs go by, also Gollum. At Angle, they debate what is to be done, and it is there that Boromir tries to take the ring from Frodo. In the event, Tolkien devoted three chapters to the company's visit to the Golden Wood, the Florian, the Mirror of Galadriel, and Farewell to Lorien. But his synopsis before he actually began the chapter of Florian included a precursor of, precursor of Legolas's description of, of the words close to those published in the text, which is what I give here. There lie the woods of Lothlorien, that is the fairest of all the dwellings of my people. There are no trees like the trees of that land, but in the autumn their leaves fall not but turn to gold. Not till the spring comes and the new greens opens do they fall, and then the boughs are laden with yellow flowers, and the floor of the wood is golden, and golden is its roof, and its pillars are of silver, or the bark of the trees is smooth and grey. The mirror of Galadriel needed much development to reach its final form. Galadriel's comment in the published text that the Lord of the Galathrin is accounted the wisest of the elves of Middle-earth and a giver of great gifts beyond the power of kings has puzzled some readers. 
in the light of Kellerborn's previously mentioned impulse reaction against wars compared with Galadriel's diplomatic intervention to pacify Gimli, and that though Kellerborn does give them good advice on their, for their onward journey, it is she who mind reads the members of the, group of the company, who has summoned the White Council, has the visionary mirror, and wears one of the elven rings, and that though she gives parting gifts ostensibly from them both, those given to Frodo, Sam, and Gimli are clearly from her personally. It did not start out like that. In the first draft, Kelleborn thought that, that, that uh, the Balrog had been sent by Sauron, so there was no offence and no need for intervention mentioned by Galadriel. Also, she says that the Lord and Lady of Lothlorien are accounted wise beyond the measure of the elves of Middle-earth. The meeting ended with Kelleborn giving the company advice for their onward journey, which they intended to continue immediately. Almost at once, Tolkien changed his mind, deciding the company should stay a while in the Florian. A synopsis includes, they dwell 15 days in Carisgaldon, King Galdoran's mirror shown to Frodo. Mirror as of silver, fi silver filled with fountain of water in sun. King Galdoran says the mirror shows past, present, and future and skill needed to decide which. Christopher Tolkien comments, it is seen that it was while my father was writing the Lothlorien story, Abinitio, that the Lady of Lothlorien emerged, and it is also to be seen that the figure of Galadriel as a great power in Middle-earth was deepened and extended as he wrote. And of course, this deepening will <coughs> continue even after the completion of the Lord of the Rings, and only was ended only by Tolkien's death. In the draft of the latter part of the chapter, it is Galadriel who has the mirror and wears one of the three elven rings. As first written, when Frodo offers her the one ring, she rejects it immediately because it is evil. Then in the far co fair copy, she, he, she introduces, he, Tolkien introduces her temptation and rejection and accepting that she must diminish and go into the west. Sorry, that she must diminish and Laurie and fail. Galadriel's gift-giving in the third chapter, chapter is in great part close to the published text, and at least some of her gifts will play an important part later, most notably the fire with the light of the oriental star, which aids Sir Frodo and Sam in Shelob's Lair and in, in, in Kerith Angor, and the box of earth with which Sam will restore the devastated Shire near the end of the story. Even more personal is the strand of hair which she gives to Gimli at his request. Lothlorien itself is one of the most memorable of all the landscapes Tolkien created, a believable and desirable Eden. Its beauty all the more poignant because it will soon cease to exist. Tolkien's use of the phrase mortal years suggests that he too felt he had created something new and out of the ordinary. While writing in spring 1944 of Frodo and Sam's journey east of the river and going to Kirith Angor, Tolkien reported regularly on his progress in letters written to his son Christopher in South Africa. Christopher Tolkien was able to use information in these letters to supplement the manuscripts while tracing the writing of Book 4. On the 6th of May, Tolkien wrote to his son Christopher, a new character has come on the scenes I'm not sure. I'm sure I did not invent him. I did not even want him, but I like him. And there he came walking into the woods of Ethelion, Faramir, the brother of Boromir. And he's holding up the catastrophe with a lot of stuff about the history of Gondor and Rohan, and some very sad reflection, no doubt, about martial law, martial glory and true glory. The manuscripts indeed show that Tolkien had not planned for Frodo, Sam, and Gollum to encounter anyone on their way south of the crossroads. And in the earliest drafts, the leader of the Thilian Rangers was Falborn, son of Anbon, a kinsman of Boromir. After the battle, as he questioned Frodo about Boromir, he described his vision of the boat bearing Boromir's body down the river, Anduin, and said, it was Boromir, my brother, dead. And in the next draft, Faramir gives way, Falborn gives way to Faramir. Christopher Tolkien comments, it is as if he slipped without conscious decision into the role that had been preparing for him. The encounter in Athelion, adding more than two chapters to the story, notable moments includes Sam's poignant feeling of empathy with the slain sovereign, 
Frodo is forced, forced, to, forced to betray Gollum to save Gollum's life and the description of the waterfall that ends the noonest sunset. Faramir provides an interesting contrast with his brother and his father. He resists the lure of the ring. He uses his judgment to choose the right course rather than blindly obeying orders. He is a brave leader who wins the hearts of his men and fights only to protect his city, not for personal glory, and willingly relinquishes power to the rightful king, a man who values the arts of peace and is interested in its tradition and law. He was to play a major role in the rest of the story in the councils and the defense of Minas Tirith. And most significantly, the strategy adopted in the last debate depended on his knowledge of Frodo's chosen route. After Aragorn has healed Eowyn's physical injuries, Faramir is able to heal her mind with his gentle courtship in the garden of the, Healy, of the, garden of the houses of Healy in Minas Tirith. Okay, so right. That Tolkien, while writing Book 3, briefly envisioned Aragorn marrying Eowyn, is shown first by Galadriel's message to Aragorn, delivered by Gandalf, and by a note written at this time. Aragorn waits Eowyn, but in a later undated note, he wrote, cut out the love story of Aragorn and Eowyn. Aragorn is too old and lordly and grim. Make Eowyn a stern Amazon woman. If so, alter the message of Galadriel. Possibly Eowyn should die to avenge or save Theoden. But then he considered the possibility that Aragorn did indeed love Eowyn and never wedded after her death. When did the idea of Arwen as a more fitting bride for Aragorn first come to Tolkien? She only entered the written text when Tolkien returned to Book 5 two years later, in summer 1946, and Halberd the Ranger brought Aragorn her message and the stand that she had made for him. She was later back written into the earlier text. What influence of any did the emergence of Faramir have on Eowyn's fate or even on Aragorn's fate? I will conclude briefly with the most startling of the transformations. Trotter, the hobbit ranger, wearing wooden shoes because he had been tortured by Sauron and who might actually be a young relative of Bilbo, Peregrine Boffin, who had run away seeking adventure, but instead was transformed into Aragorn, son of Aragorn, the rightful king of Arnon and Gondor, by descent from Elendil, who had established the realms in exile after the destruction of Numenor, and through whom he was descended from many of the leading figures of the First Age. Aragorn's coronation as King Alessa and his marriage to Arwen, daughter of Elrond, his cousin many times removed, provide climactic points in the story. And yet it was not until the hobbits reached Bree on their return journey that Trotter would give way to the more impressive nickname Strider. Mm -hmm. Further, the transformation of Trotter, transformation of Trotter into Elessa Telkandar with strong links to the first and second ages, not just a few reused names, few are reused names, transformed the Lord of the Rings into a sequel to the Silver Alien, dragging the Hobbit with it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, before we go to questions, hearing you um, reading out some passages earlier made me think that a new audio book with you as the narrator would be something I would quite enjoy. Um, <laughs> shall we turn to some um, questions? If we have any, oh, you've baffled them into silence. <laughs> I mean, if, if any of you haven't sort of plotted to ask sort of looked into the history of it. Uh, there's a fascinating amount of material there. And if you just see the, uh, the uh, multiple, multiple ideas that Tolkien had, and which really he didn't use, I'd love to have heard some of the things about how he was captured by true beard and escaped and, and what who had, you know, what actually, one of the interesting things, I did this as a brief talk to Exeter College a few years ago and decided to expand it. And at that point, the whole of the Gandalf bit was missing. I'd done the bit about the unpremeditated change. And that was that. And then I suddenly realized, but actually, that's not the point. The point was the disappearance of Gandalf. But, but 
Does any, how many people here were at MythCon in Marquette in 1987? What a question. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, at that at the, I didn't do it, this wasn't video, but it just fell out. But at that point, Christopher Tolkien gave a talk called Where's Odo? And he traced that story from the opposite side, from Odo's point of view. Just looking at what happened to Odo in the different things. And I didn't do it deliberately, but I suddenly realised I was, I was doing the other side of Christopher's paper. <laughs> Do we still not have any questions? Yes! <laughs> it's going to be good. <laughs> Did you find any uh, differences in Eowyn's story? In the... Eowyn. Eowyn. Eowyn, sorry. Um, well, I mean, I didn't... I know that... I know it... It's certainly... It's pretty clear that when he f wrote the first of these in, in book three, that Aragorn really was attracted to Eowyn. And it, it's, that he was looking that way. That way, and um, and I think I think maybe he just felt that it got came to feel that it wasn't right, or perhaps he liked the idea of having her as a more warrior woman rather than somebody who was kind of it would be a queen, be queen more suitable. Aragorn, after all, is about 80, 85 <laughs> compared with her, and he probably he's probably you he know he's going to live for about another hundred years, which she would not as much with her. But I didn't find, but yes, it does, doesn't really tell, give you very much detail. It's still parts he played with. And if you want to, if you play some of the places where he really tried out, I mean, he, he, had, Frodo, he had Frodo imprisoned in Kirith Ungor with no idea how, how he was going to get him out. And, it, he, and he kept on, this time he was, this time he was also very um, in trouble because he was having to bring so many threads of the story together that he, he kept on having to change things. Um, I have a question for you. I read in one of the books, and I can't remember which one, but there was something said or written there that <coughs> Professor Tolkien was considering quite a bit changing the nature or the character of Galadriel. Could you comment on that? Well, he said, I mean, the character is certainly, he, can, he, he continued to change her. Yes. At the beginning, it looks as if King Galderon is going to be the main, is going to be more significant. But almost immediately, she takes the lead, as if she takes over from him. I don't remember him change, he, he was certainly going to change Galadriel's, what Galadriel had in was in the Silmarillion. You may be thinking of that because he, there were, the, the, he, early on he suggested that she had participated in the kinslaying <coughs> in Feyenoord's re revolt. And he then decided that she didn't and he didn't want her to be. And, the, and then when I was the, the last thing he wrote was she is, she, you know, she is guiltless. Yeah. He decided that she didn't go, that there was no matter. I think this is probably what you heard. I don't think it was so much in the Lord of the Rings, but he definitely battled with putting her back, putting her back, writing her into the Silmarillion, because she didn't exist in any of his Silmarillion stories before this. Um, and he definitely was fighting to say, no, he didn't have, Galadriel hadn't taken part in the King's Day. Yes, Oh, okay, um, but the, was the, um, did the nature of the ring change um, from the early draft to later on? It took... I haven't gone into this in detail, it's not one of the ones, but it definitely took Tolkien a long time. First of all, the rings were definitely not anywhere near as strong. That. They had certain powers, uh, but they, they definitely grow in power throughout. It takes him a while to work out um, exactly the, the, what the Elven rings did and who had them. Um, but he, he certainly the rings become more powerful and more great. They're not quite as, uh, they know it. they're not as, in, this, in the very early drafts, but they, once he's got himself at least the Council of Elrond, 
the things are much more set up. And it's probably uh, in, in uh, the Benothlorian chapters that he finally decides the exact relationship between the, the various rings. Last question over here. Tolkien's strong <coughs> women characters form a loose inverse correlation with his ease of getting them published. So the Hobbit, no women at all, publishers grab it immediately. Silmarillion and other later stories get about in his life and packed with great women. I'm wondering to what extent Eowyn and Galadriel, the changes in his portrayal, were they driven by feedback from, from his readers, from other people, from his friends or from his publishers? I I mean, of the fan letters that one has, well, the fan letters that are kept in the Tolkien estate are mainly Lord of the Rings. I do, I, I, yeah, I think people noted at the, that there were no women in The Hobbit, but then it was written for three boys. Yes. You know, so, it's... I think what I'm trying to say is, if he wrote a story with no women in, a publisher snapped it up. If he wrote a Luthien or someone like that, publishers looked at and said, no, this is a bit too strange. It would seem that when he actually put a woman character who is important to him, that he really worked at her and developed her and often gave her much deeper. I mean, Eowyn and, and, and Galadriel, they are among the most complex characters that he, that he has written. Partly, of course, because he developed and made change. But Whereas most of the rest, a lot of the rest of the, um, the rest of the fellowship are not very complex. You know, in, Legolas isn't that complex, and Gimli isn't that complex. Aragorn probably is, but then he is a rather special one. Um, and I mean, even in the Sil and then again you have, when you say, you say, when you go to the Silmarillion, you have, when he has, when he, I think a woman has to be a strong woman for her to him to be it. If you think about it, Idril may not have enough much to do, but she's the one who makes the, who saves something of God. And Luthien is very powerful. Melian is. Yes. And certainly, even when you look at the Valar, yes, so but one, one thing, maybe because we're women, but we may feel very attracted to uh, Varda and to Niena and to, well, I've lost it, nature, yeah, yeah, nah, nah. Yeah, I, I, think, I think sometimes, when, I think when Tolkien did produce a female character, he put a lot into her. Yeah. So I think that might be fair. I mean, even, even his, uh, even his Eureth is a character study. And the people are back. Thank you very much, Christina.